Welcome to season four of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Today, our topic is an underappreciated way to save many lives from overdose by expanding access to life-saving treatment for opioid use disorder with medications in jails and prisons. I speak to Dr. Brendan Saloner from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health about a new report outlining a path forward. The report is available at americanhealth.jhu.edu. Let's listen. Brendan Saloner, thank you so much for coming to the podcast. We're talking about overdoses, and a lot of people were surprised to hear that 2020 was a high mark uh, in the not good sense, the historically high number of overdoses, more than 93,000 people dying of overdoses in the United States. Yeah, we have a full-blown uh, public health crisis going on right now related to overdose risk. Um, our opioid crisis uh, really accelerated in 2020, and it's uh, it's unfortunately bad news on, on many fronts. So among the different strategies to save lives, from the overdose epidemic is a renewed focus on people who are incarcerated. Why has that become such a focus? Well, I think the the short answer is that people who are incarcerated are at very high risk of overdose. Um, One of the reasons for that is that many people who have an opioid use disorder and that population is certainly overrepresented in jails and prisons. When they become incarcerated, they often undergo forced withdrawal. And that forced withdrawal dramatically increases the risk that they will fatally overdose if they go back to using drugs after they are released from jail or prison. So it's an incredibly important moment moment to potentially change the trajectory of someone's life when they're incarcerated. So in a sense, it's both a time of heightened risk because people could, they could even overdose while they're in jail, for example, or soon after they leave. But I think you're saying it's also a time of opportunity for treatment. Yeah, I I absolutely believe that. Just to take one step back, I think the most therapeutic place to treat people with opioid addiction is not in a jail and prison. So I think it's important to emphasize that we would like to see more people being treated outside of that context. But for sure, there is so much opportunity to save people's lives when they're incarcerated by giving them access to what we know to be an evidence-based treatment. And so tell me about more about that treatment. Sure. So a gold standard treatment for opioid use disorder is treatment with medications. There's three medications that are currently approved by the FDA. I'll just say what they are, methadone, buprenorphine, and naltrexone. Uh, Each of those medications uh, has been shown to substantially reduce risk of overdose. And I think the key thing is that there's no wrong moment to start people on, on medication treatment. It can start basically from the moment they're incarcerated and hopefully it will follow them into the community after release. So if I'm hearing you correctly, first of all, it's best to get people treatment before they're even involved in the criminal justice system or divert people away from the criminal justice system. But for people who have to be incarcerated, there's this opportunity to give them medication treatment. And how well proven is the medication treatment? Well, you know, especially for methadone and buprenorphine, we know that medication treatment reduces the risk of overdose by more than 50% compared to the alternative, which is treatment without medication. So medication is a is a huge life-saving um, intervention for many people. And so what's the problem? It seems pretty simple. We have people who have uh, this addiction. We have a treatment that reduces the risk of overdose by 50% or more, even in the middle of this national surge in overdoses. So, you know, how common is it to to get these life-saving treatments? You know, we don't have any hard data on this question. Um, I 
I would say that it is certainly not the standard of care right now for incarcerated people to get access to medication. So there's a few uh, um, facilities that are in the Vanguard jails like Rikers Island in New York or the Rhode Island Department of Corrections um, that have been providing medication as the standard of care. What we can say from those places is that it takes a lot of logistical uh, change. It takes a lot of implementation work, but it can be done. So it's something that we'd like to see happen universally, but there's there's some real steps that have to be um, undertaken to make it widely accessible for people who are incarcerated. So walk me through some of those steps. I know that you've been thinking about why so few places are offering life-saving treatment and what it would take to turn this into the standard of care and potentially save a lot of lives. Yeah, thanks. So our team has just put out a report based on a convening that we did with experts from across the spectrum um, to identify some of the key challenges that need to be overcome. And basically, we broke it down into five key challenges. Um, I, I don't necessarily need to talk about each of them, but just to give an example of one of them, controlled substance regulations. So Methadone is a highly controlled medication. It can only be dispensed through specialty clinics. So if you want to provide methadone as a medication for incarcerated people, you need to have one of those kinds of programs either set up or a close partnership with one of those programs in a jail and prison. So, you know, this is something that many facilities have worked through the logistical challenges, but there's so much regulation and red tape that has to be overcome to actually get the medicine to the patients. So this is an area, it sounds like, where some policy change might just make it easier for jails and prisons to provide access to this treatment. Yeah, absolutely. And we think that there are some things that can be done um, you know, in the very near term to, to pave the path for greater access to these medications in jails and prisons. So we do see a lot of opportunity to change the laws, uh, to make it uh, easier to get that medicine to the patients. What? Other examples are there of things that can be done differently? Well, I think another one is just culture. And um, I don't um, mean to say that it's simple, but there is a lot of work to be done in changing the attitudes around addiction for incarcerated people, reducing stigma and a lot of um, negative um, attitudes toward people who have opioid addiction, trying to kind of reframe the issue so that it's understood to be a medical condition that can be treated rather than a failing of a person's character. And also to destigmatize the medications, which are you know very often incorrectly seen as being either a crutch or substituting one addiction for another, which is absolutely not how they work, but I think there's a pervasive myth around that. And we've seen that, again, many jails and prisons have done that work of trying to change the culture and it's made a big difference. So I, I recall speaking to one um, jail director myself and I explained the potential value of adding treatment like this to the jail to save lives, help people. And, and, and the person stopped me in the middle of my sentence and said, so let me get this straight. They're smuggling opioids into prison and you want me to give it to them for free. Yeah. So we hear that a lot, unfortunately. I think that it does come from a very real issue that jails and prisons deal with, which is if they're not offering medication treatment, many people who have addiction are trying to, by any means basically possible, to get access to opioids to deal with their withdrawal when they're incarcerated. So there is a real problem of contraband in jails and prisons. And you tell a warden, you know, we want to start a program that is offering a medication that you've been trying very hard to keep out. It really takes a mentality shift. On the other hand, I think that it also provides an opportunity to address a real concern that the security staff have. If you start treating opioid addiction, I sincerely believe, and I think there's some evidence to back us up on this, that you will see a reduction in those contraband problems. You will see actually improved safety and security in the facility. So I think that there's a way to sort of really straightforwardly address the concerns that a lot of people might, might initially have hesitation about treating addiction. Right. So, so you're basically saying to a jail or prison director, look, you have a choice. You can have a lot of untreated addiction or you can have treated addiction. Those are the choice. There's no choice of no addiction because there's so many people in the facility who have a substance use disorder. But if you're going to have to choose between untreated where people are 
uncomfortable, unhappy, huge risk for contraband and treated where people feel a lot better and they can, you know, uh, accomplish positive things um, and don't really need the contraband, it's better to choose treated addiction. Is that fair? Totally. And and by the way, we can make your jail or prison a happier and safer place for everyone. So, you know, I think that that's an important point to emphasize. So what is the trajectory for getting more jails and prisons on board? What, what has to happen? I think that there's push and pull factors. So one thing that's happening in a very real way is litigation. Um, so lawsuits basically... Um, showing that it's a violation of the Americans with Disabilities Act. It may also be a violation of the Eighth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which um, prohibits cruel and unusual punishment of of people who are incarcerated. People have been making those lawsuits and winning those lawsuits, and that's actually made a big difference. I, I think litigation is important. I think that it's also important to try to get more voluntary change, and we're seeing voluntary change through state encouraged through resources from states, from localities, trying to get kind of uh, government bought in and saying, you know, let's pay a little extra money to get this going because it's an investment that will ultimately pay for itself. Do there need to be more sources of funding for this kind of work? I mean, are, are the resources adequate? Yeah, I think that it's something that has to get budgeted for. And unfortunately, um, correctional medicine is always a little under budgeted. So Money has to be set aside for these programs, but they might not be as expensive as many people fear. And in particular, when you think about potential cost savings and and also cost savings because you see lower recidivism and better outcomes after release, I think it's a big chance to ultimately save some money by um, spending a little bit up front. And so maybe with the settlements from the opioid litigation or some of the other federal funding, if states and localities can put some money to this, they'll find that not only are the jails, you know, experiencing fewer problems within the jail, but that you have fewer people suddenly showing back up after release because they're able to transition to treatment and recovery. Yeah. If I could talk to every governor in the country and tell them about some opportunities to take some of that settlement money and use it in a way that will achieve their public health goals and possibly ultimately save their state some money, this is one of the first things I would tell them about. Great. Well, we're going to um, direct listeners, if they're curious about reading your report, how to do that on the American Health website at Johns Hopkins. Um, And I want to thank you for explaining this really underappreciated but critical topic to our listeners. Yeah, thanks for having me. really appreciate it. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharpstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, C.N. Oates, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo and Neiman Outlin. Social media support from Brenda Hagater, Grace Holes-Fernandez, and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.